Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about the newest medication that's approved by the FDA for ADHD called Kelbri. Its generic name is Biloxazine. Um, while I'm talking, if you have questions, you can type them in, and I will get to them at the end of the presentation, which will be 20 minutes or less. This will be posted both on Facebook and YouTube later. So with Without further ado, I'll just launch into it. So this is the first really new, but sort of really old as well drug. I'll get in a minute to what I mean by that. Approved, drug approved for um, ADHD in, since 2009, I believe, when um, a form of guanfacine Intuniv was approved. There have been several formulations of both Ritalin and Adderall things like Enhancia and Enzikio and a bunch of others approved in the last um, decade. So those are all form and Jornet is another one, formulations of old medications. This is a new medication, new structurally different, pharmacology different than anything else out there. However, it's actually not a new medication at all. So Veloxazine and one other sort of aside or clarification, Viloxazine is the new drug Kelbri, and Kelbri is with a Q, no U, Q-E-L-B-R-E-E. -E. This is not to be confused with Velazidone, um, which is the generic name for Vibrid. Velazidone was approved about a decade ago. It's a SSRI with serotonin 1A modulating action um, for depression. Viloxazine is a completely different structure in pharmacology. So veloxacine was actually discovered, designed, as it were, in the early 70s, was first released and marketed way back in 1976 for depression in Europe. It was used more than two decades in Europe and then largely, apparently for business reasons, it wasn't being sued, it wasn't causing problems, um, just wasn't making enough money. Um, it has not been on the market for almost two decades. And in the U.S., it was never, I'm not even sure they applied for approval in the U.S., it was never approved as an antidepressant. However, and it wasn't ever officially approved by the FDA, it was given orphan drug status and used briefly for a few years around 84, mid-80s, for narcolepsy, um, where it seemed effective. Um, Again, they never sought full FDA approval for it. And, I'll, and one other area, there's been some research other than both depression and um, ADHD, is there's some research that it may be effective in treating alcoholism. But, so the recent approval is an approval for the use in children ages 6 to 17. So like most ADHD drugs, most of the research is still conducted first on children. It's still apparently a bigger and more lucrative market for the drug companies. Pretty much everything that's been shown to be effective in working kids has been shown to be effective in working in adults. I wasn't able to find any published studies, though, of Veloxazine, Calbury yet in adults, but I would, there's nothing to indicate that it would not be as effective there. Um, the impressive things is that the Veloxazine, Calbury, one is they've studied several hundred kids, so it's not just a few tiny trials. Again, two, we have safety data from decades of it when it was marketed as an antidepressant. There are no common, particularly dangerous side effects. I'll get to side effects in a minute. Um, what else? Um, this is an extended release form, um, and it's approved in a dosage range of about 100 milligrams to 400 milligrams a day. And the capsules are at 100, 150, and 200 milligram capsules. And it was found to be effective both against inattentive and hyperactive symptoms of ADHD. Um, the other interesting and good thing about it is that the studies were conducted in a way that it could be shown that it was having an impact within the first week. So they weren't taking data points earlier than the first week. But in all of the studies, there was improvement by week one. Um, there continued to be greater improvement 
between weeks one and four where things seem to plateau out. But on one of the commonly used ADHD rating scales, my, my sort of my examination, these are not precise numbers, there was about an eight point decrease. So you want a lower score if you're functioning better, having fewer symptoms by week one. And that was statistically significant in most, not all the studies, some studies the placebo group did almost as well. Um, and almost an 18 point difference by weeks four through eight. Um, none of the studies, formal studies have looked longer than sort of a several eight week period. Um, there's again, nothing currently that would anticipate that people would lose their effect or gain much more effect over greater periods of time. Because again, the, the benefits did seem to be plateauing out at a fairly substantial sizable benefit range in somewhere in the four to eight week range, things were plateauing out. So initially in, when it was used as a antidepressant in Europe, the sort of claim in the, the um, pharmacologic studies suggested this was a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And so we would think, aha, this is pretty similar to Stratera or Atomoxetine, which is a pretty clean and simple norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Um, but more recent studies suggest that although there's some strong bind, bonding binding to the norepinephrine reuptake, to the norepinephrine transporter molecule and recept, norepinephrine, norepinephrine reuptake receptor, um, that in actual life, the norepinephrine reuptake action may not be that particularly strong. And that would be supported clinically by the suggest by the, the data so far, and again, the old data, that cardiac effects, although not absent, so it can increase blood pressure slightly, it can increase heart rate. These effects seem to be less robust than either with our stimulants or with our Stratera. Um, so they found action on two subsets of the serotonin system. So on the serotonin 2B, this is a serotonin 2B blocking agent and a serotonin 2C agonist, so it's binding to it. So currently, riloxazine Calbri is considered a serotonin norepinephrine modulatory agent. Um, of note, there does not seem to be any potent serotonin reuptake action. There also seems to be no potent action on acetylcholine systems or histamine systems, so those are responsible for some of the sedating and other problematic side effects with some of our other psychiatric medications. And there don't even seem to be strong direct um, dopamine receptor system actions, which is maybe mildly surprising in, an act, in a drug that's successful for ADHD. Um, in terms of um, side effects, the only ones in the formal study, and, and often the longer things are out there, we, we often see slightly different side effect profiles emerging, but the only side effects that were both dose related and hit the level of affecting more than 10% of people were headache and sleepiness. Um, sleepiness hitting almost 20% of people at the biggest dose, 20% of children headache maxing out at just about nine or 10%, but again, lower rates at lower doses. Um, there were other side effects at less than 10% rates, nausea, vomiting, um, decreased appetite, vertigo were among them. Some of the warnings that this product has, again, it has a warning like all antidepressants in the United States do of an increase in suicidal thoughts or ideation. Um, there were individual cases of increased suicidal thoughts. I am not aware of any reports of actual suicide action on people on this agent, but that's something to look carefully for in the first weeks, particularly of treatment. Um, it does have the potential for triggering um, manic episodes or hypomanic episodes in people who turn out to have bipolar disorder. So careful screening for bipolarity is important particularly given that there's a lot of overlap between ADHD and bipolar symptoms, and there actually seems to be substantial comorbidity. So having ADHD does make it more likely than the general population that you'd have bipolar disorder itself. Um, what 
out of there. And, and there's also some potential it interacts with some of the liver enzymes that metabolize some other drugs more strongly than some of our other psychiatric agents. So again, this is dissimilar than Stratera or Adamoxetine, which is purely, pretty purely a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Um, it shows some similarity to our SNRIs, duloxetine, which is Cymbalta, and Milnasopran, which is Sabella or Fetsima, which are both have um, significant norepinephrine reuptake, and both of those also have significant serotonin reuptake, again, which Biloxazine does not have. Um, so again, this may well, patients may well respond to this differently or more positively or differentially than they do to anything else that's been out there. Um, again, it has benefits over a range of ADHD symptoms and in terms of side effects, they don't seem, there doesn't seem to be anything particularly alarming or horribly dangerous. Um, why or how the intricacies of affecting the serotonin subsets may help or affect ADHD, I'm not going to discuss further because my estimation or reading of it is that it's all speculative and when we come up with elaborate speculative explanations for mechanisms of action were so often at least incomplete, if not completely wrong, that I'd say it's usually better to wait till we know more there. Um, so that is about all I have to say. I don't know what price range they're marketing it in. Um, the same company, which is called Super Noose, which does have a few other products out there in the psychiatry, um, neurology realm. Um, they are, at least some studies have indicated, working on an indication for depression um, for this same drug. So that would be, if it's approved in the U.S., the first U.S. FDA approval for this drug for depression. And so that's about all I'm going to talk about today. So this has been a little shorter than usual. I I'm not seeing any questions. I'll mention next week's topic, which is the connections between sleep apnea and ADHD. I know I've given a few other talks about different aspects of sleep, but not directly addressing sleep apnea, where there are strong, it's not completely clear how common, but there can be profound interactions between sleep apnea and ADHD. So again, I'm not seeing any commentary right now. So I will sign off till next week. Stay safe, be happy, and have a good week.